Hello there. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, um, good night, if you're listening as you are going to bed. Um, hi, welcome to Talking to Introverts. This podcast is coming to you from myself, Denise Oliver, and my co-host, Sammy Blackford. Say hello, Sammy. Hello. Hello. Um, we are actually recording in 2024 now. I can't believe we're in 2024, but there you go. We are um, hoping that everyone is well and, um, you know, Christmas, New Year, all of that has been good to you. There's been lots of weird illnesses around. Um, my family seem to have managed to run the gamut of them all. <laughs> or is it the gauntlet of them all? And uh, we are coming out the other side of it now. Thank the Lord. So um, today, what is our topic, Ms. Blackford? What shall we discuss? Um, so today we are going to talk about something that we've seen through many women, especially. I'm going to say women. Mm. It could be a man thing as well. And any men listening, if you resonate with this, let us know in the comments. Um, but what I've noticed, and I know we've talked about this previously, as in, you know, between ourselves, is that women who work in, I'm going to use the word spiritual type practices, so therapists and that kind of thing, struggle, I'm not sure that's the right word, with the whole money and business thing. So that's our topic for today. And I feel like I've kind of opened a whole can of worms. <laughs> <laughs> that's all right we can open cans of words um because we are aware we watch it we see it don't we um that and it is a struggle and it becomes quite a um a quest to prove that they're right in many ways um and i think it's i'm going to say it's more a woman thing than a man thing mm -hmm. and it's like the healing modalities so um in that let's really open this can of worm worms uh, i'm going to put things like um crystal healers um reiki healers reflexologists women who when they do their training are taught money and business mm. it's all about the therapy and the therapies are great they really are god i love crystals i've got loads of them don't use them in a formal healing capacity, but there are times when I just know I need to hold one for some reason. Don't know what that is. And I don't question it. I just do. Um, and I've had many a Reiki session. I learned Reiki one up to level one, but I was never taught by anyone who did any of those how to incorporate it and create a business from it. Mm. Not a natural businesswoman. I've had to learn everything about business as I've gone along. Um, and once I did learn aspects of business and <laughs> why would I need a business? Well, if I go into a supermarket and there are many named ones out there, but let's just lump them all together. I can't walk into that supermarket and pay with my crystals or offer Reiki healing to the cashier, or as it is now, the machine that I have to scan everything through. I can't do that. I actually have to have money. We don't have a barter system anymore. So at one time, maybe, I don't know, going back in time, it would have been that um, you perhaps barter your skills, but then going back in time, you would have been a witch. <laughs> and um, hmm, look what happened to them. So the system at the moment is, is that we use money to exchange goods and services for it. Mm. And I think once I had seen that and I stopped being afraid of money and having money and what that looked like, suddenly my world changed. It really did. It's like, oh, yeah, I like money. Money's mm. fun. You can do a lot when you have money that you can't when you don't. So yeah, this whole thing of spiritual needs versus reality needs, I think is uh, it's a big deal for a lot of people. 
And it's only because you, if it doesn't come naturally, you, you're not taught where to go, where to look, who to, who to ask about making money and how much of it you want to make. And I'm not saying that everyone should, must have exactly the same amounts of money. That's not what it's about. But if you desire a particular um, level of living, whether that's your secluded shepherd's hut by a river, sounds gorgeous, or whether it's a mansion in the countryside or a mansion in town or whatever it is, my personal point of view is make money however it comes to you because once you have money you can actually create more in the world you can go out there and you can help more people because you can employ people because you can um, donate money you can donate things but without it in society the way it is right now you can't do any of that <laughs> i feel like there's a lot to unpack there i know um there you go and yeah i think i think you're right what you said about um you know when people learn their what i'm going to call a modality so their therapy or whatever it is that they they choose they're not taught how to actually run a sustainable business with it yeah. and obviously you need to know how to deliver your therapy yes how to give the best to your client in that session, whatever that session is. And also, you need to, ha you need to know how to create the business around that because if, you, if you're not creating a business, it's a hobby. And I'm very matter-of-fact about this now. Like when I, when I talk to people, I'm just like, look, this is how it is. And it's because I learned it the hard way. So when I was in the early years, my uh, skincare business, I was that person. So I grew up and lived in a not very prosperous area where, you know, a jar of skin cream was like three pound in the, you know, the savers shop. And that's what I knew. And that's what I knew with regard to pricing and what people paid for skincare and stuff like that. So for me, when I charge £10 for a jar of cream, I was like, oh, my God, I'm like, oh, who's going to buy this? Nobody's going to buy it. And even at that price, with what I was putting into the product, so growing the herbs, processing them, formulating the recipes for the products and creating them, at £10 for a jar of cream, I was running at a loss. And... Um, I have to say it was a business coach that I only saw for a few sessions, but out of all of the business coaches I've worked with has had the most positive impact on uh, my business life. It was, it was him who said, you know, you've got to put your prices up. If you're delivering a quality service, a quality product, people need to pay for it. And it's, you know, that obviously oh, oh, made me kind of oh, cringe inside. And there was one thing he said to me was, yes, you want to help a lot of people, but if you're not staying in business, if you go broke, if you go bust, who are you going to help? I'm like, oh, yeah. So then charging, I'm going to say good money in inverted commas, as in money that gives you profit and makes your business sustainable, is actually doing your clients and customers a favor because you're staying in business and you can continue to provide that product or that service for them um, for the long run. It's a difficult one, isn't it? When I think some people naturally have a money mindset. I really do. I've watched it amongst friends, you know, friend, because I'm from a medical nurse and doctor background and there are, doctors out there who would be who are called wheeler dealers they're always into something that makes them money mm. and some people think that they're like dodging the system no they're just very aware of where the money is and how they can make it work for them now i think that's the same in life 
we can all find ways that aren't illegal to make money. I mean, people are making lots of money on illegal things as well, but that's not what we do. Um, I couldn't live with myself. Um, and a bit like you just said about your products, the thing about pricing appropriately, it's not about what the next person's doing. It's about what are your requirements to live? If you're not asking enough money, how are you paying your bills? Whether that be your rent, your mortgage, your shopping, your utility bills, your, you know, for your phone, your Wi-Fi, your laptop, your car, your petrol. How many people actually sit down and properly map out exactly what they're spending. And I'm going to say not many. Mm. Not as many as I'd like to see doing it. Mm. When I didn't understand any of this years ago, and I really couldn't sort of make my husband's salary stretch because I'd stopped nursing with three children. And... um, It was only when I became ill that I disappeared off into an alternative world uh, and did nutritional healing. Before that, I still was, I was a stay-at-home mum who had to budget. I was rubbish at it, absolutely rubbish. And I didn't understand what to do. So this is a piece of advice I'm going to give you that I heard on the telly. If you don't know how to manage your money, look amongst your friends at the person who always appears to have money, who back in the day when I needed to pay babysitters and that, and I couldn't afford it because I didn't have that money, there were always women in my circle who could. And now their husbands weren't earning what my husband was earning, but we're all living in a similar area, similar size mortgages, paying similar bills, and yet there were those of us that stayed home (laughs) and those of us that didn't. And it was like, that was a choice that I didn't like. So I looked around at all the people that, um, that I knew and I targeted one person and I went on a dog walk with her and I asked a question and she gave me all the information I needed. She told me exactly how she budgeted. She knew to the penny every single day how much she could afford to spend. I'm like, what, every day? <laughs> you know? And to me, I was, it was like a horror story to me. It's like, oh my God, I'm going to have to spend so much time looking at numbers. Oh no, <laughs> not my thing. Still isn't my thing. Um, because that's not how naturally my brain works. But once I'd had that conversation with her, I actually started to watch programmes on the telly. And there was a guy back in the day, I've still got his book, Alvin Hall, who looked at people's spending habits. (laughs) Gosh. And honestly, I just learned so much in such a short space of time. I still do it today. I look at how much money is in my bank account and I divide it I divide the number of days that that money has to run over and whether I've got 5p or 500 pounds for a day, exaggerations, um, I know. And so the day I've only got 5p, I don't go out. I don't spend anything. I wait till it accumulates. Mm. And I look at when I'm going to have to do a shop. Like, How much money have I got that I can spend on this shop today? And once I put the practicalities in place, I've never looked back. I don't have an issue with money anymore. I don't have an issue with asking to be paid, A, what I'm worth, but B, what is required? What is required to keep my business running? What do I require to live my life? Mm. And everyone will have different levels of requirement. And for me, that's not right or wrong. It, it's whatever it is you choose for it to be, mm. you know, where you choose to live, who you choose to associate with, etc. So I think like the overarching message is that it's not unspiritual to charge money and have, you know, a good, in inverted commas, business. 
Because that's kind of what we're taught, isn't it? If you're spiritual, then you don't need that stuff. We all still live in this this reality, don't we? Where you have to go and pay, like you were saying, with actual money um, if you want to do your shopping. And I think then there's the the flip side of that is like a lot of the more spiritual business coaches like, well, charge your worth. You know, what are you worth? You need to charge your worth. And I think actually, again, having learned this the hard way, there needs to be a separation there between your self-worth and your business or service or product worth. Because then we get to the point where if we charge our worth in inverted commas and, you know, like we put our prices up and charge X amount and people don't buy it, then we question our self-worth. And I think that's another challenge that we can come up against. So then if we separate, okay, I know I'm, I'm, you know, I'm alive, I'm breathing, I'm a human. I already innately am worth whatever, you know, I am worthy of being here and doing what I'm doing. And then we look at, okay, so what's the business, the product, the service worth? And that's, that's an interesting question. So you can look at what's already in the market and get an idea as in, you know, what your competitors are charging. But it all depends on what customers are willing to pay. And by that, I mean like, so going back to the skincare example I was talking about earlier, if I had a targeted my product at the people around where I live, then yeah, they would have paid maybe five pounds for a jar of cream. But if I went to a different area, targeted a different type of customer, then, you know, I could charge £50 for a jar of cream, which I did end up doing. So it's not just the, a lot of therapists that I have spoken to over the years say, oh, well, it's a, say it's a 60 minute session. So it's this much. And that's one way of looking at it. But also what's, what's that client going to get after 60 minutes? It's not just the time that you spend with them. It's the results and the ongoing value that people are going to get. So for example, um, I had a lot of lower back pain for when I was younger for a couple of years. And if I had found somebody who could have solved that in like a 60 minute session, that would have been worth more than just paying for that 60 minute session because it would have you know, got rid of the pain for the rest of my life. And I've been reading this book really recently. And um, it's by a young guy in America. And he's talking about, um, you know, like how to market your services and all of that. And he says, charge as much as you possibly can for whatever it is that you're selling. As in like obscene amounts of money. And then you just need to find the people who will pay that. And I kind of feel like there needs to be a middle ground. There still needs to be that bit where, okay, it might feel a bit uncomfortable to charge whatever it is that you choose to charge because there's the whole thing of stretching our comfort zone. And I mean, for me, charging £50 for a jar of cream was like, oh, my God. Um, And yet there are products out there, aren't they, that are way more pricey. Oh, yeah. Like I've seen jars of cream for £200 for a jar. Um, so yeah, there's, I think there's a middle ground between, you know, playing small and just charging what you think people will pay and charging the obscene amounts of money. There still needs to be that place where it's a bit uncomfortable, but it's, you, you can do it. You're okay with doing it. But what he says in the book is um, it's all about the perceived value. And if whatever price you pay, if somebody sees that as, a good deal as in they feel like they're getting more than they're paying then they'll they'll pay it i know for me that one of the things i kept doing when i wasn't attracting clients and making the money that i knew was out there and that i i could make because i knew my stuff well, I'd just go on another course because, of course, I needed more information, didn't I? So if I had another course that I could offer, this whole list of things that I could do, well, that would work, wouldn't it? No, (laughs) it absolutely doesn't. And the thing about that was that it dawned on me very late 
that the only people who were making money out of me going on the course were the people who were offering yet another course in whatever it was that I was seeking to sort out within me. And really what it came down to at the end of the day was I had a poverty mindset. Mm. And it was that that I had to sort out. It was that that I had to look at. It was all the beliefs that I had around whether I could or I couldn't have money. And once I looked at that, and I, I looked at how ridiculous it was that just because I'd come from a very simple life, beyond simple really, in a city Manchester as it was back in the day, um, I was brought up where Manchester City's Etihad Stadium is now. Well, it's not poverty stricken anymore around there. That's a massive employer. And I know people begrudge the amount of money that's gone into that stadium. But I look around at where I was brought up and I look at the improvement for people in that area. And I'm like, no, bring it on. Come on, you want to keep this place going. You want this place to look affluent and be affluent because it's improving people's lives who live in that area hugely. The amount of money from the Etihad Stadium that's gone into local resources that is giving people jobs is phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal. And yes, the footballers get paid a lot more than everybody else. I don't have a point of view about that. I don't have a problem with that because when I went on the stadium tour and I heard what those guys and the girls for the women's football team, their dedication, their determination to be the best that they can be, as far as I'm concerned, I can't do that. I wouldn't know where to start doing any of that. And I'm not, it's not in me to do that. Good luck to them. I hope they get all the sponsorship and all the money that they desire from being the person they, they are and doing the job that they do. I, I really do. I don't have this point of view that they've got loads so they should give it away. Mm. And I think that's where this whole spirituality thing comes in. If you're working in a more spiritual field, you can't have loads. So you just give away your services for next to nothing or for free. Oh, my word. Tesco's aren't going to give you something for nothing for free. Mm. Dainsbury's aren't, Aldi, you name it. Then none of the supermarkets are going to do that. None of your utility um, suppliers are going to do that. That's not how the world works. Don't give your services away, for goodness sake. And I think it comes from a good place, doesn't it? The whole, yeah. you know, they want to help as many people as they po they possibly can. They've got this skill. They've got this gift. They've got this purpose and, you know, they want to help as many people as they can. And, you know, that's, that's a great place to start a business from. And coming back to what we've been saying, if you're not making money, if you're not keeping uh, food on your table, a roof over your head, fuel in your car, and just the general basics of life, then you're not going to be able to continue with offering that service and helping as many people as possible. And you're going to end up burnt out as well. Yeah. They and I, fail all the time. And I think there's that point where a lot of people I've talked to, a lot of women in this sort of business that I've talked to over the years, they want to charge enough so that they can make enough to, you know, keep the, I'm going to call them the basics of, of their life, um, you know, cover the basics. But then I feel like we need to go one step beyond that. As in, if you're always worrying about money, if you've got the basics covered, great. But then what if an unexpected bill comes in? What if you need to repair damage to your car? What if you need to, you know, do X, Y, Z that you weren't expecting and isn't in your, you know, everyday basics budget? You're always going to be stressed about money. And then as somebody who has had business stress for many years, that will inevitably come into the room when you're treating a client. 
if you're stressed, that is going to affect how you work with clients. And so are they getting the best from you when you want to help as many people as possible? So then it comes to that point, okay, so you want to cover your basics and then some, because then you can be more relaxed about business and money and deliver a more easeful from a sense of you being more easeful service to your clients. And then like we can keep going, you can go a step above that and then, you know, beyond easeful is joyful. Okay. What would, how much money would you require to really live a joyful life? And then that will come into your practice with your clients. So I don't think um, as coaches, therapists uh, in that line, that modality line, we, we often end up with a very rose tinted spectacle view of what our business will be like. Um, we want premises, we want beautiful, serene premises, um, all of that sort of thing. And it, and often we just don't take into account the long term payments for that. So you might work from home, but you're still going to have to heat your home all day long. If you're seeing clients coming into your home, you've got to pay that bill. Mm. If you're renting a premise uh, outside of your home, you've got to pay the rent. And the bills on top of that. And it's that whole thing of if you don't know how to look at the numbers, talk to someone who does. And it can be scary to go, I don't know what to do. It's it can be like quite intimidating to talk to someone who the wording for money just trips off their tongue. They love it so much. They will talk numbers and money and on and on and on it goes. And if you don't get to that point where you're okay, you don't have to be fully, I'm not saying go out and be an accountant or anything like that, but if you're not okay to talk about your bottom line with someone, it's never going to change. And you're not going to enjoy the the wonderful modalities that you've trained in. And you're going to, you're just going to keep doubting yourself. And I think this in business has a lot to do for women in particular with the imposter syndrome that gets set up. And at the base of all imposter syndrome is stress. What is stressing you about your modality, the money that you know you're worth, but you're not asking for and keeping a business going? What's the stress about? So what do you, what's the information you require? It's not doing another modality. Trust me, I've been there. I've done that. <laughs> it's not that. It's understanding your bottom line and not being in debt and offering your service in a way that works for you and in a mm-hmm. way that when it's working for you, your customers are very happy to pay you because you're happier. And I I do think as well that there are, what's the word, Um, like in the press and things like that, there's um, that you can be lambasted for uh, actually charging what you know you desire. There are Mm. coaches out there and they're usually men that charge thousands of pounds a session. And I'd like to see women doing that as well really being up there, knowing Mm. their stuff, knowing their worth and being willing to ask for what they're worth and ask for what they know they they actually need day to day and more. Uh, And I've said to someone in the past, I said, do you realise that if you actually charge for your services, there are times when you can then offer a service for free but don't do it until you've got more than enough money in the bank. Do you have money that you could live off for six months? You know, and if you haven't got that, then you can't offer yourself for free. Don't do that. Is my point of view. You might disagree with me. I'd love to hear from you if you do. Yes, there was something that you said earlier that I was going to comment back on and I can't remember what it was. It'll come back to me if it wants to. Um, I just want to plop in there um, those little nagging, niggling voices that we hear that tell us that we're not good enough. I know that I'm a pleaser. And as a pleaser, I will often step up and do stuff that 
isn't getting me anywhere <laughs> and takes up my time and effort in ways that don't support my business. Um, and I have to really listen out for that voice that is go say, you know, sort of goading me to keep pleasing and be out there rather than staying with my business and doing things with and for my business. Um, and there are some people who won't have that at all. There are other voices I have, like there's a victim voice, you know, well, why have you gone to that person? Why haven't you come to me? I know my stuff. I know just as much as she does. Mm. And it's that listen out for those voices because they're not helping you. They're not serving you in any way, shape or form. Mm. Um, you might not even know you're doing it. That's the other thing I didn't for a long time. It took me a long time to recognize that that was happening in my you know, sort of in my head and resentment was building within my body. So of course I couldn't offer a service that was joyful, forget joyful, good grief. Um, I could offer, I wasn't even calm and ease filled <laughs> at times. It was just, I, I didn't understand what I didn't understand, but gradually it's come to me. Mm. Like it's come to you, hasn't it? Gradually yeah. you get there. I've remembered what I was going to say. Um, when you were saying about, you know, people will train in one modality and then, oh, that's not working. I tell you what, this is the modality I need to do. Because, I mean, we're all influenced by what we see, aren't we? And these days, so much of it is what we see on online and on social media and the rest of it. And we can see that somebody trained in this thing and then overnight they've got this huge wonderful business which we all know logically that we're only seeing people's highlight reels online we don't see all the blood sweat and tears behind the scenes and yet we're, we're still caught get caught up in it um and i think that's one thing going back when people are taught their therapy their modality they're not taught how to build run sustain a business and I think this comes back to that, as in people don't realize how long it takes to establish a business. And I think that's where this um, skill stacking <laughs> that we uh, call it comes from. It's like, oh, well, I've tried, just use an example, I've tried running a business as a Reiki therapist. That didn't work. Okay, maybe if I'm a reflexologist, that'll be the thing that works because I've seen X, Y, and Z on social media and they are really successful in that therapy and again <laughs> i've learned this the hard way and i think when it comes to business you need to choose one thing and stick with it and then when you have gained a level of success and again success can be whatever you choose it to be with that and then if you want to introduce a new service then go and train in that and I think it's that when we try and be everything to everybody is when we can fall into um, challenges and issues and doubts and fears around business because we are so scattered and like we don't understand what's going on in our business so how do our clients understand what's going on in our business? And because if you think of, um, if you're looking for a therapist, say, who, I'll go back to the, the back issues I had when I was younger. I wanted somebody who specialized in pain in this area of my lower back and could fix that. I didn't want somebody who promised to, you know, rub my feet and, sort my chakras and whatever else and whatever else. I wanted somebody who specifically dealt with this problem and could fix the problem I had. And I think that's what a lot of people in business, again, I've been there, I've done this. They want to help this person and this person and this person and this person and this person. So they'll do this thing and this thing and this thing and this thing and this thing. Where it comes down to... I am really good at this thing. You should come to me for it. And that's where we, we I would say get rid of, but we lessen the imposter syndrome 
because we know we're really good at this thing. And we build our confidence. And then with that comes the confidence to charge more because I'm really good at this thing and you should come to me for it. Yeah. When I think about um, some of the, I'm just thinking about here in Chester, some of the most successful practices are the ones where if it says chiropractor, you know exactly what you're getting. Mm. And it's not just one chiropractor. It's a whole host of them working from the same building who might have learned that modality from a different um, teacher. I don't know, chiropractic tutor. I don't know. Uh, and the same with osteopathy. Uh, I know Deirdre Stubbs, who started the Osteopathic Health Centre here in Chester. Um, she started that with another osteopath. And then they they actually sublet their other rooms to other osteopaths. Uh, Deirdre just focuses from home now. She sold off her practice and it's still an osteopathic practice. Lots of osteopaths working from the same space, like physiotherapists. You won't go and see a physiotherapist. You know what you're getting. You know, it's it's just stick with something. If it's not right for you, if you've started in the wrong place, fine. But when, like I've done, nutritional healing, Psych K, which is a form of kinesiology, Reiki 1. Oh God, what else have I done? So many things. I was access consciousness for 10 years. I've now got havening techniques. And what I love about havening is the simplicity. It was always meant for me. It just wasn't available all those years ago. But I had bright, shiny-itis um, to do with courses oh no, this is great. This works really well on my body. Right, I'll go and train in it as well. And then I didn't know what to do with it. Who was I talking to with all these different jars on the shelf? <laughs> um, I'd go and see a herbalist. It's like, I didn't fully know what a herbalist did, but going to see a herbalist that talked to herbs and put your potion together, it's like, oh, that's what a herbalist does. Great. But that's what she did all the time. I went to see an Alexander technique. I was very tempted to, to learn Alexander technique. But Janet just focused on Alexander technique. And that's what she was known for. Oh, you've got this problem with your body. Oh, go see Janet, Alexander technique. Um, what was the other thing I used to go to? Amatsu. Have you ever heard of Amatsu? This wonderful therapy. I used to go and see Linda. Uh, my body balancing, as I called it, as she touched bits of my body and things suddenly started to work again. Amazing. Um, so that uh, Amatsu is um, therapy for ninjas. So it's actually come out of ninja training and it's like the therapy that <laughs> keeps their bodies together so they can go off and do their ninja thing. Um, so it was that that I suddenly realised that those people who had stuck with their training, but actually developed their training by adding on like further Amatsu training or further Alexander training, were making good money in their business. It's what they got known for. Not that they uh, could do crystal therapy and they could do um, Reiki or they could do reflexology or they could do a massage, Indian head massage and all of this weird and wonderful stuff that does work. No, they stuck with that modality and they just developed that modality. I was mm. even tempted because I did so much yoga at one time, which I'm very much going back to, doing yoga training. Like, that will work, <laughs> you know? And it's just like, no, stop now. Go mm. to yoga classes because they're good for you. Doesn't mean you should do full-on yoga training. Um, uh, yeah, the, the bright, shiny itis thing is something that I've had to work on as well, because I'm just spending money all the time. I'm not looking at how to um, gather money, save money, invest money, have beautiful objects around me. I wasn't doing any of that. Um, but now, oh, my goodness. Now it's very different. I am glad to say very different. And I... I What's happened for me with money is that 
I've stopped, um, what's the word? Just shopping for the sake of shopping. Mm. I don't do that anymore. I have such a respect for the money that comes to me now that I really didn't have before. The money wasn't going to come to me um, because I, I, I just didn't value it. It wasn't part of who I was. I grew up with very little, next to nothing, um, on the streets of Manchester as they were. But now, no, very different. I don't go all out just to spend it, you know, just because I can. No, actually, what what do I need right now? Mm. And I think that's a way to become okay with the idea of charging money for your products and services as a spiritual person in business is that developing that more spiritual relationship with money. So yes, we've talked about like the reality that we live in and we need money to live day to day and all of that. And there's that having the respect and the the relationship with money as in remember one um coach or somebody that i worked with over the years um she used to say you know you see these men in the bar they come up to pay for their pint or whatever and they just fish in, fish their hand in the pocket and bring up a load of crump- crumpled notes in their hand it's like that's not a respectful way to treat money you know keep it nice keep it in your wallet your purse whatever um keep it in a way that shows it care and attention and respect and that's more when it will show that back to you um a very spiritual way to think about money and if that's what you the kind of way of approaching money that you require to become comfortable with money then do it and there's a book that we always recommend. I recommended it to somebody the other day. Profit First by Mike McCallowitz. That's how I'm saying his name. It could be completely wrong, but that's how I'm saying it. That even after I felt that I had improved my relationship with money, reading that book was an eye-opener. As in how to actually deal with money in your business from a very practical point of view. A really simple point of view though. And it's, you don't need like, to be turning over a million a year to be to be able to use this formula it's so simple and as soon as i instilled it like the following month i had never felt so flush in my business <laughs> just of how like it was the same amount of money pretty much but just how i looked at it differently and worked with it differently um yeah really good book would recommend it and the other person I'm thinking of, uh, there's a series on Netflix and there's a couple of books as well, is Ramit Sethi. Mm. Just uh, the simplicity with which he talks about money is phenomenal. It's yeah. well worth the watch. I, what's it? I can make you rich. I will make you rich. I something. The, the, one of his books is I Will Teach You to Be Rich. Yes. I can't remember what the Netflix thing is called, but similar sort of words. Yes. Um, and it's, it's very interesting how, I think, how secretive we can be about money and what mm. we spend it on. And if we're in a partnership with someone else, how we just can't talk about it. We don't want to talk about what we do with it. Like the other person doesn't know. Um, there's that couple where Ramit recommends that they have a joint account and the wife... <laughs> partner goes absolutely not <laughs> because of her husband's gaming addiction yeah yeah the amount of money he was spending gaming had really spiraled them into a huge amount of debt but they had like a hundred thousand dollars in debt or something and her whole aim was to have her own home couldn't get a mortgage with a hundred thousand pound debt um yeah it's very interesting how it's such a major part of our life and we don't like to talk about it. Mm. I, I mean, you and I love to talk about we it. We talk about it all the time. <laughs> I'm, so, I'm about to say, we love talking about money and how we get it and what we do with it and where it's going and coming to and everything. And yet uh, uh, there was a time where I would not talk about it because you don't talk about that. I know. But it's that whole thing of, it's a serious thing, money. 
Mm. You have to get serious to have money. You have to get serious to make money. You have to be very serious to enjoy money. You have to be serious to have a business. What if you could have fun with it? Let's just flip it on its head, shall we? What would be fun for you to spend money on? Right now, just think about that. What have you always wanted to do that you know you need money for? And you don't, it's not like I'm saying have so much money you don't know what to spend it on because you've got so much you can spend it on everything. Mm. And what do you desire to spend your money on? What have you stopped spending your money on that you'd really like to be spending your money on? Mm. Um, and I just suddenly got that whole thing of I want to go back to yoga lessons mm. or yoga sessions, not lessons. I don't want to learn it. Um, and it's like, why aren't I doing it? It's not like I can afford it. So what's stopping me? And it's that. And it's that. I know I hear I've heard women go, oh, I had to stop going horse riding. I couldn't afford it anymore. This is like, so if you could afford it at one time, why can't you afford it now? What are you spending the money on? now that mm. you were back in the day um and uh, flip side of that like what can you do to earn the money to be able to afford that again yeah i think that's a good point because like i've never been one that's been motivated by having lots of money you know and like and i know people women in business who are like you know i'm all for the money you know you know as much as i can possibly have and that and like all for that you know if that's your thing then go for it but you know when people say like they have a seven figure year and all that it's like it doesn't interest me it doesn't excite me I'm just not that bothered about that but having something like actually I really want the money to be able to do this that is what would motivate me and like we've been working with a client recently haven't we where she had a goal to go traveling with her family and Obviously, she needs X amount of money for that. But if she had just said, my goal is X amount of money, knowing her as we do, that wouldn't have worked as much as having no. this this, <laughs> this image of this goal that she had to go traveling with her family was much more, had much more of a, a pull for her than this money, mm. which she does need to do this goal. But, you know, it's a different way of looking at it. Yeah. It's like you, you might be into cars, a, a luxury car might be your thing, but you're stopping yourself from having it because you've got this mindset that people with money are mean and horrible. And if you have this luxury, I don't know, because I'm not good with cars. I just looked out the window and there's my little lovely sitting there. But if you if you go to a car showroom and it's a Porsche, Jag, um, Aston Martin, whatever they are, I don't know, um, Mercedes, that's another one, BMW, blah, blah, blah. I know the names. I could not tell you the model. <laughs> and you go and sit in the car that you truly desire, that is what will motivate you, not how much the car costs. Mm. Because you might find a three-year-old one that costs a lot less than a new one and that's a more, um, that leap isn't as difficult as buying something brand new. It might be that you're into art and you want to have a collection of some sort. The thing is to go and look, to go and feel if it's pottery or something like that. And that's your target. It's very tangible. Mm. sometimes just the figures on a page don't work that's not how it's worked for me as I was developing my my style with money what I would do was um, I would actually go around charity shops not just to buy any old thing but to look for the thing that really when I picked it up and this is very Marie Kondo brought me joy it's like oh I, I, re I really want a lovely mirror for this space but where do I start but we didn't have eBay and stuff like that back in the day you had to go looking for it and often I would find what I liked because I preferred older more antique looking stuff but even back then in charity shops or antique shops and that's how I started collecting things buying stuff that I could afford that was actually worth way more mm. than I bought it for and so it was that whole thing of I surrounded myself with the luxury that I desired slowly but surely. 
And the more I did it, the more money it came to me so that I could keep doing it. So it's, it's, a my, it's so, such a mindset thing. I know that I still have rumblings of a poverty mindset. Mm. I still do. It comes up, I get caught short by, what have you spent your money on that for? (laughs) You know, and it's just like, God, that's ridiculous. Stop it. You have got the money for this. But so why am I telling myself I don't? Mm. don't Listen for those voices that are yours, but they're not helping you. They're the negativity voices. And we have such a negative bias in our brain that we will get the negative before we get the positive. Yeah. I had walked into a shop, say a charity shop, looked at something, knew this thing was for me. And I walked out and walked around and had to talk myself into going back to buy it. And part of me hoped it was gone. It's like, oh, great, it wasn't for me. It wasn't meant for me. No, actually, it's still there. <laughs> oh, OK, I am taking it home with me. But in a reluctant way rather than in a joyful way. Mm-hmm. And it's just like, this is silly. The games we play with ourselves, let alone with anyone else, are ridiculous. <laughs> um, makes me laugh so much. So much. So moral of the story, people, is that <laughs> you can be a spiritual person and have money and have a successful, sustainable, profitable business. It is possible. It is all within the remit of being spiritual. And it actually, if you have, if you're making good money, have a profitable business, you can, I'm going to say, be more spiritual because you can help more people and spread your gifts around more freely. Absolutely. Absolutely. Money's here to stay right now. Mm-hmm. So it's, not going, it's not disappearing. And yeah, money is used for bad, but it can also be used for good. Yeah. And I always think like on that point, because there's so many, I mean, we can go in the whole limiting beliefs around money direction. That's another story, I feel, Mm. a topic for another day. Um, But on that one, like there's so many people that we have met over the years where, you know, having money is evil and, you know, all of this kind of stuff. And as our client has recently introduced us to, people with money are money wankers. Um, which is just a great term Um, and my personal belief on this is money makes you more of who you are so if you're already like a very um, values driven purpose driven ethical spiritual whatever name you want to give yourself in that kind of remit person it will make you more of that it will help you to express that more fully if you're already a bit of a knobhead and you know a bit of a (laughs) a Scrooge or whatever you want to call, whatever the opposite of all that good stuff would be, it will make you more of that. <laughs> yeah. I just, well, I'll put it my way. If you're an asshole, you're still an asshole, whether you've got money or not. <laughs> yeah. You just are. You know, money doesn't make you like that. Yeah. You just are like that. <laughs> and the opposite is true. If you're a nice person, money, you will be a nice person, whether you have money or not. Yeah, totally. Just that if you've got money, you'll be a less stressed, nice person. <laughs> yeah, completely. Re- really, truly. Oh, money. One of those topics, isn't it? Money, it money, is. money. Money and business. Um, so I feel like there's so much more we could say on this, but for today, Denise, are we done? I just want to just do a name check. I was going to say, okay isn't there somebody we need to, we need to yes. give a shout out to? So, Mr. Dawkins, dearest Alistair, thank you for listening. Um, my friend Sarah, <laughs> and apparently we've all got a my friend Sarah somewhere, <laughs> so Sammy says. Um, <laughs> that's another conversation. Um, uh, has told me that you're listening. Alistair, dearest Alistair, thank you. Really, really appreciate it. I just wanted to uh, give you a name check. Yeah. Um, I've listened all the way through. <laughs> of this ramble that we've been on and um, I hope you enjoy it and uh, just drop us a comment and then we know that you have or you haven't if you've got comments to make that goes for everyone who's listening we really do appreciate you and uh, welcome to talking to introverts in 2024 I was going to say if you want to follow in Alistair's footsteps 
and drop us a like. Go for it. No one can we, see We it. appreciate it. No one can see your thumbs up. I know. I'm like doing the <laughs> thumbs up sign as I'm saying it. Uh, give us yeah. a like. Those um, thumbs are up now. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Say bye, Sammy. Bye. Bye, everyone. Back with you in a couple of weeks.